question, what do we know now, what do candidates and experts know now that FDR didn't know back in 1935? When did the science get to a point that a, that a Hillary-esque level of communication sophistication became possible? What, how much of that is instinct and how much of that is science? So you start. Well, that's a lot of questions. Uh, all right. Uh, first, what's legitimate? Say what you believe. Express the values you really have. You cannot do it without framing and without metaphor. So be effective. Be eff use it effectively. And you can't just use it, make up some slogan uh, in the air. You have to evoke frames that are already there. Just as, as you were saying, you have to evoke what is there already in people's mind. George uh, Soros talked about the packaging of information. We all think in terms of the packaging of information because uh, our conceptual system is in our physical brains. Culture is the packaging of information, and, and I, a personal identity is the packaging of information. You can't avoid it, so the question is how do you use it legitimately and for the truth? Now, there is a problem, and the problem is uh, the Enlightenment view of reason. That the assumption is that you, that everything is conscious, that it uh, doesn't use frames, that it doesn't use metaphors, etc. That is false, and we need to know that it's false. We need to be armed with some understanding of cognitive science and neuroscience to know that it doesn't work that way. And what happens with the Democrats is the following. You get a certain number of people who are neoliberals. They have the progressive moral view that they care about people and they want to act responsibly on that care, but they can't reason about it because that would sound weak. Instead, they have to use reason about interests. And so what they do is they find some place where there has been some market failure for an interest group. It might be college loans, S-chip, veterans, whoever. And then they make up a program to help that, to get over that market failure by uh, having regulations or uh, subsidies or whatever to help that interest group. And that is exactly what's happening with the health care plans. That's why they're going to insurance instead of a non-insurance plan. They're not telling a truth. The truth was told by Michael Moore. Namely, insurance companies uh, in health insurance make their money by denying care. They are the opposite of a market. In a market, the company that delivers the most product makes the most money. With health insurance, the company that uh, delivers the least product, given their premium, makes the most money. The more they can deny you care, the more money they make. And that will always be true of insurance. So all of the plans out there are a market failures waiting to happen. They're not willing. Yeah, Kucinich is one who is not, and, and so is Conyers. Okay. With 676 is, is now got 82 people in support. Let's go on to Drew. Do you have answers to those questions? Uh, no, <laughs> but okay. that does, I'm an academic, so that doesn't stop me from, from speaking anyway. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, um, I've already lost. I've already lost the first one. It was about the um, ethics of communication. If you don't say, just simply oh, right. tell the truth in plain spoken terms and call things what they are, because life is more complicated than that. Then what can't you say? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think you know, this is this is probably the only place where I disagreed with with George was that I thought the first part of that Orwell quote uh, was was absolutely correct. I think in many ways. 1984 should have been called 2004 and been a critique of the Bush administration, but Orwell, of course, couldn't have known that. Um, I think his, uh, his Orwell's essay on politics and English language could have been a wonderful critique of the, of the Democrats' language, who, um, who offer turgid prose and facts and figures. I mean, the latest example being um, you know, the most remarkable one where, um, uh, where here, here was a bill that was about making sure that working parents can take their sick kids to a doctor. Now, I believe that's plain language, and that's spoken in values-based terms. I, I just said what it's about. And, and Democrats ran around calling it S-chip. Exactly. Why would you ever do that? It, it's the same thing as, it's the same thing as it, it took from 2006, it took a, 
It took a year in, uh, from 2006 to th 2007 to finally start breaking the association of the war in Iraq uh, and the war against, against ter Islamic terrorists. So when does the Senate invite General Petraeus to uh, show up to give his testimony on the war in Iraq? On September 11th. Now, if you think in terms of networks, you wouldn't do that in a million years. That's the last date. Uh, General Petraeus should have been nowhere near the Senate or the House in September uh, of, of, of this year. It should have been October if it had happened, if it had happened at all. I think I'll stop there and... Well, let me... Can I just... Frank, yeah, jump in. I learned my trade, my craft, from Bill Clinton. I did not know anything about language. I did not really begin to study it until 1993-1994 when Bill Clinton reframed. It was no longer tax increases. They were revenue enhancements. That was Bill Clinton's phrase. In the same speech, it was the State of the Union Address of 1996, he talked about, and I quote, ending welfare as we know it. And in the same speech, he had 11 programs that would, quote, assist the poor. What the heck is welfare? But he changed the dynamic, and I watched him in speech and language. This didn't exist to me until I watched Bill Clinton, and that's how I started to study the power of words and phrases, and it was Clinton that led me to the death tax rather than the estate tax. Let me, let me nope. ask one last thing before, because we have audience questions that Andres is going to read, and that is going to the, the stated purpose of the panel. Does anyone have evidence that there, the science of understanding language and communications is actually being used by people on the ground today running for president and other offices in ways that simply were not available to Franklin Roosevelt? When did that start to happen? How do we know that's happening? The dial technology that they saw wasn't available back then. When did that no. become available? They started to use that at the end of World War II to test advertising for the war. Madison Avenue adopted the technology in the mid-1950s. TV, the, the shows that you see on television, had two buttons, a red and a green one. They used that in the 1960s. And it was Dick Worth then who first used uh, instant response in 1984 for Ronald Reagan. And then in the mid-90s, I brought it to television. Yeah, uh, the Democratic candidates all over the country used Don't Think of an Elephant as a book to talk about values and to not use the other guy's frames. And I won't tell you how many letters I've gotten from candidates all over the country who won in red districts saying they figured out how to talk to conservatives. There's a section of the book that says you talk to conservatives by finding out where they already share your values because they're usually biconceptual, usually partially progressive. And that's why Schweitzer won in Montana. He loved the land and he knew how to talk to, to Montanans about that. I mean, this is uh, something that's come out of cognitive science, which now gets out there to candidates who have begun to use it. They need to, to do a lot more. I want to say something about Richard Worthlin and trust. Worthlin, I spoke to Worthlin about what he discovered about Reagan. When he became Reagan's chief um, pollster and strategist, he did a poll, uh, and he found out that almost nobody liked Reagan's positions on issues. They just wanted to vote for him. And so that he didn't know why they wanted to vote for his candidate. But when he studied it further with other focus groups and so on, he discovered that Reagan talked about values, not issues. If it was issues, it was to, to illustrate a value. He sounded like he believed what he was saying, and Worthland thinks he did believe what he was saying, so he's authentic. People therefore felt they could trust him, even if they disagreed with him, and therefore they could identify him with him. And so he ran the campaigns on values, authenticity, a trust, and identity, not on issues. And that's what people are voting on. You ask about why people voted for Bush. Very clear, he ran that, uh, his campaign on just those ideas. And there's a question of, is Bush smart? 